Well, we come now to the last major section of uh, Paul's letter to the Romans before we come to the conclusion. And um, I suppose the good news is we've, we've looked at all the hard stuff. Um, this is easy from now on. Um, I, I suggest that we could really just summarize this and say, be loving, you can go home. I mean, uh, that's, uh, that's the main point that Paul is uh, making. This section, Romans 12, 1 through 15, 7, has frustrated the commentators. And um, as a non-commentator myself, I'm always a little bit happy to see the commentators frustrated. Um, uh, they don't always know as much as they think they know. And uh, the main thing that frustrates the commentators is they look at this section, Romans 12 through 15, and they say, it just seems sort of a jumble. Now, they, they're usually too polite to put it quite like that. But uh, it ends up with them saying, well, Paul just apparently has several random things he wants to cover, and so he goes one after another, and it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, particularly, they say, you know, mainly in this section, he's talking to the brothers, how the brothers should relate to one another, brothers and sisters, how they should relate to one another. And uh, then all of a sudden, he talks about the civil government in Romans 13. Where does that come from? How does that relate? Uh, well, it's just because he has this jumble. He has this little checklist. Do you, do you make lists in the morning? Uh, my wife is a great list maker. You make lists of things you're going to do. It doesn't necessarily mean that one thing on the list relates to one another, except that you have things to do. So you check them off. Paul has a list of stuff. He has leftover file cards he needs to get into the essay. So uh, is that what's going on here? I don't think so. I think, are you ready? You already know. You see it on the board there. I think this is a chiasm. Now, the fact that I appear to be the only one who thinks so probably means I'm wrong. But nonetheless, that's how we're going to proceed. I think Paul, once again, doesn't have a jumble. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's talking about. And uh, he has arranged this material in uh, precisely the way that material to many ancient minds was most logically related. And uh, I think uh, we'll see that as we go along. But particularly interesting to me as I was looking at this is that in chapter 12 at verse 19, he talks about judgment. And then at the end of this section in Romans 14, verse 12, he's back to talking about judgment. And suddenly it thought to me, why is he talking about judgment twice? If I have a list a random list I'm going through. I talk about judgment once, and then I go on to something else. But he talks about judgment twice. That suggests there's something going on here of, of relationship, of structure, that will help us understand better uh, the argument he's making. So that's how we're going to proceed. And I, I trust, I hope, that I'll be able to convince you that this makes sense and is actually illuminating and uh, helpful to us to see what Paul is calling us to. Now, again, the, the big thing Paul is calling us to uh, is very clear. He's going to say to us, think about who you are. In light of who you are, love the brethren and serve one another. You know, most of the time what the New Testament says is really very simple. Um, and it's the simple things that are the hardest things. Um, look at the world we live in. How many people think? Distressingly few. How many people love? Maybe even less. How many give themselves to a life of service? That's particularly hard, isn't it? And so Paul is saying something very simple, but very profound, and one could say very difficult. And that's why when we come to the center of what he's arguing in this section, his message is, wake up. Wake up to thinking. Wake up to loving. Wake up to serving. That's what we're called to. And it's not easy. It doesn't come naturally. It isn't automatic. It has to be cultivated. And that's why we need a couple of chapters to look at it. We can't just give the one-sentence summary and go home. So we want to follow uh, the way in which Paul is thinking. And we want to look at the beginning of this section in these well-known verses and statements of appeal that Paul makes to begin uh, chapter 12 of Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. 
brothers. Who is he talking to? He's talking to Christians, Jews, and Gentiles. Uh, it's not that this is divorced from what's come before. He's just been explaining how Jews and Gentiles are related in the plan of God, in the electing purpose of God, in the mission of God, and now in the life of God's church that's being lived out. He appeals to all the brothers, um, Jews and Gentiles. I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Um, that word for mercies there is very unusual. He doesn't use it hardly at all. Um, it's meant to be somewhat arresting. And I think it's meant to say, you know, I've been talking about God's mercy from the beginning of this letter. I've talked about his mercy to sinners. I've talked about his mercy in Christ. I've talked about his mercy in, in sanctifying you. I've talked about his mercy in his electing purpose. In light of all of those mercies, I appeal to you. In light of all that God has done for you in mercy, I appeal to you to present your bodies. Now that's a bit of a surprise, isn't it? Might we not have thought he'd say, present yourselves, present your minds, present your souls, present your lives, present your bodies. Well, that immediately reminds you of something, doesn't it? Uh, one of the things we need to see in Romans is how intricately interconnected all the pieces are. Paul is really taking up uh, the theme that he um, introduced back in Romans 6, verse 12. That's what you were thinking, right? Um, what did he say in Romans 6, verse 12? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. Remember in Romans 6 through 8, Paul has been talking about how we as Christians live before God, how we live out our lives becoming more holy before God, how his grace that justified us, as he talked about in Romans uh, 3 through 5, how his grace that justifies us now sanctifies us. And one of the ways he talks about that is contrasting our new minds that have been given us in Christ with the continuing reality of bodies that live in this world and are headed to death. It's not that the body is the seat of sin, it's that the body is the sign of sin because it's dying. And the new mind has to be engaged to discipline the body uh, where the flesh so easily dwells, or at least where we can see the flesh more clearly often. And so he's really returning to that theme that he took up uh, in Romans 6 through 8, the theme of how we live before God as a redeemed people, how we grow in grace, uh, how we make progress in holiness. And as Romans 6 through 8 is really about how we live as Christians before God, I think we can say Romans 12 through 15 is how we live with the brethren. Uh, we struggle in our lives with the brethren um, just as we struggle with our life before God. Uh, holiness is hard relative to God to be cultivated, and love is hard to cultivate with the brethren. And so he's really returning to this same theme of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, and we're going to come back and look at those words because they're very important. But then he goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world. Uh, now, there's a huge challenge, isn't it? Don't be conformed to this world. Earlier he said, although it's a different word in Greek, be conformed to the Son. So we want to become more Christ-like and less worldly. Um, the trouble is... As uh, the poet has said, the world is ever with us, around us, and within. Uh, the world and its claims are persistent and constant. But Paul's call to us as Christians is, do not be conformed to this world, 
to its standards, but be a transformed people, be a changed people, be a different people. By the renewal of your mind, wouldn't that be a great slogan for a ministry? Uh, renewing your mind. Somebody ought to take that up. It's a great idea. Uh, renewing our mind. You see the contrast that he's, he's come back to, the same one that he developed in, in Romans 6 through 8? Present your bodies by the renewing of your mind. Uh, think straight and it will help you live straight. That's the point he's making. You have to know the truth. The truth will set you free. It, it's by renewing your mind, transforming your mind, liberating your mind from conformity to the world that your whole life will begin to look the way it ought to look before God. Um, by renewing your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. <clears throat> and knowing what the will of God is doesn't come automatic to us. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful in glory? when our will will just always do what it ought to do, that will always serve God. Um, but now we have to test what God wants us to do. What is his will? What is his good, acceptable, and perfect will? We have to pursue that. We have to study that. Uh, we have to read letters like Romans to get our minds renewed so that we see and know and begin to... Um, uh, understand the will of God. Now, my Bible makes a break there. I don't think we ought to make a break. I think verse 3 belongs to this introductory appeal. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. What's our besetting sin? What's our fundamental sin as Christians in relation to the brothers and sisters? What's the, what's the great problem? We think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Um, now, I'm sure that's not a problem with you. It's just the problem with the Romans. Uh, the, the Romans uh, would be tempted, wouldn't they, to have an inflated opinion about themselves. They're pretty important. Uh, they're pretty grand in world history at that point. They're the superpower. They're rich and they're famous, and uh, Rome is the capital. Um, these words don't apply in Orlando. They would apply in Washington, D.C., but maybe they apply in Orlando, too. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they apply to all of us. Our temptation is to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And the antidote to that is to have our minds renewed, to have our minds transformed by the grace of God. And, and the way that we make progress is, is thinking about the mercy of God. You can't think too highly of yourself if you really understand the mercy of God, if you really understand your need for the mercy of God, and then understand the greatness of the mercy of God and the cost of the mercy of God, um, that we might be redeemed in Christ. It's a remarkable thing. And that's what Paul is saying is, the way in which our minds need to be renewed. Now, that renewal of mind, it's a, it's a priestly work. It's a temple work. Do you notice the language, the temple language that's here? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. That immediately puts you in the temple, doesn't it? It's in the temple that sacrifice is offered. A sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. Holy. Uh, you know, the sacrifices in the temple had to be without blemish, right? That was one of the requirements. And, and what Paul is now saying is everything in the Old Testament, remember, he's the... He's the expert on the Old Testament. Over and over again, this letter, he's showing. He's the one who really understands the meaning of the Old Testament. And what he's saying is the meaning of the Old Testament is that all of that stuff, particularly in the temple, were pointers towards what holiness would look like for the people of God after Christ came to offer the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. And so what does the temple mean for us? Well, the temple means we understand our lives better. Uh, who are we as we live before God and with the brethren? We are 
people who sacrifice ourselves. We give of ourselves. We give up ourselves. We give ourselves to die for the service of the Lord. That's what a sacrifice is. But we're not a sacrifice that dies literally as the the animal offerings in the temple died because we're a living sacrifice. Our whole life is a life of sacrifice. And uh, that's what Paul is appealing for us to recognize. And this life, this sacrificial life, where we're putting to death the old man and bringing to life the new man um, in relation to the brethren, this new life is our spiritual worship. Now, this is intriguing because um, the word for worship there is very much the word for temple worship. Um, There are two main words for worship uh, in the Bible. One is the word for kneeling down. Uh, Kneeling was the general posture of worship, and so kneeling down is the general word for worship. But the word here, sometimes translated service, means the worship service offered in the temple. It's a very temple word. And um, some translations, instead of spiritual worship, have translated it reasonable service. And you think, this Greek stuff must be hard that you can... uh, have that wide an option, reasonable service or spiritual worship. Um, I think what this means is our whole life now is service as worship to God, fulfilling what the Old Testament always meant, spiritual in the sense of now fulfilled, now fulfilled. Um, Not in the old signs of the physical temple, but now in our lives as the temple before God. And Paul will return again and again in this section to use temple language to get us thinking about living. Um, But what Paul wants us to see here at this moment is that our living is a spiritual worship activity for God. Now, some people have as too often happens, take this out of context and say, well, all life is worship, so we don't have to worship on Sunday. You know, stop taking verses out of context and uh, look at the whole. You have to look at the whole. And the whole is that our whole life is worship, and we also gather for worship. So these things are, aren't in any sort of tension with one another. That's just silly. Silly, I tell you. Renew your mind. Don't be conformed to the world. All right, settle down, settle down, settle down. <laughs> Um, be reasonable. Um, uh, but, but Paul is helping us see how everything about the temple in the Old Testament is leading us to think of ourselves as priests who are worshiping God and as the sacrifice that the priest offers in the service of God and calls us to be holy and blameless before him in love. And so Paul is appealing to us to think straight, to live carefully, to live faithfully. And um, in verse 4 then, he goes on to this section on love. For as one body, we have many members. Present your body, and that means not just you individually, but all of us together. We're one body together. What a glorious thing. What a wonderful, what a wonderful privilege. And um, it's true as we see it, isn't it? We just had a wonderful experience three weeks ago in our church. We received uh, four new members. Um, Now, this is a church, the old folks are all immigrants from the Netherlands. So it's a nearly perfect church. Um, (laughs) But it's, 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 one would say it's quite a Dutch church, except that, you know, about half the folks are Frisian. If... If you don't know what that is, um, you, you know, you've led way too sheltered a life. But the four people that joined our church, uh, one was an Indian from India who's the only convert from Hinduism so far in his family. And the other three were Chinese uh, who had been atheists in China. And what a thing to see happening. 
that uh, not only crazy Gentiles from the Netherlands have been saved, but crazy Gentiles from India and China have been saved, and we're all one body. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that glorious? It's exactly what Paul is talking about here. And he says, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we're one body. We're all connected. We should be loving one another, but we also should recognize we have different gifts. And, and that's critical in a body. Paul has used this idea elsewhere, hasn't he? That, uh, you know, um, I may be a finger and you may be a toe, but we need one another. And uh, uh, this is, is the reality that should not lead us to thoughts of envy or superiority. I mean, that's one of the themes he will take up in this section. Um, but we all need all of one another. The body suffers when anyone is left out or neglected uh, or marginalized. And so he talks about some of those gifts that individuals have. Gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So here's a full range of, of uh, activities in the body of Christ. Not all of them. This is not an exhaustive list. But he's mainly talking about teaching and leading and serving and how the body of Christ needs all those things. Uh, and we ought to use them to the very best of our ability. And in using them, verse 9, he says, let love be genuine. Uh, here's the great motive. Here's the great um, work. Here's the great reality. Uh, that uh, love is what binds us together. Love is what should direct us. Love is what should uh, help us at every point. Uh, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. How important that is. And, you know, that's an important word for the, the church today, isn't it? Um, that we need to love one another. You know, part of what that means is we have to know one another. Actually, I think in my experience, it's easier to love people I don't know. <laughs> but that's probably not a good thing. It doesn't speak well of me. Um, in order to love the way the apostle is calling us to love, we have to know one another. The church has to be a place of community. And uh, that, is, that is absolutely critical for any application of what Paul is saying here. Um, because while there are legitimate and important ways of loving the brethren around the world. We can pray for the church around the world. We can give for the church around the world. But most of our loving needs to be done in the local congregation, right? And um, that's where it can be most difficult. And that's what Paul's calling us to. We, we must not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And when we stop doing that, then we'll be able to love the brethren with godly affection, with a, a humble spirit, with a real concern and regard uh, for the brothers and sisters who are close at hand. So he's calling us to this renewed life, this life of a renewed mind, this life of sacrificed bodies, this life of care for the brethren, and why? Because of the mercy of God. How can you not love those whom Christ has loved? How can you not love those for whom Christ died? That's what Paul is saying here. And calling us, you see, to a whole different way of thinking from the way in which the world thinks. And we'll go on to follow the apostles' thought on that next time. Any thoughts? I thought that saying said it's it's very 
How do you say that? It's easy to love strangers. Everybody, but it's harder to love someone you know. Yeah. It's I easy to love those you don't know. Yeah, it, it's true. Because it, you got to face it. There's some people, you, I mean, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, but I, I, they just drive you nuts. <laughs> and of course, we drive them. <laughs> yeah, we were different for them, yeah. too. And now we've got to throw that aside. But that's yeah. not easy. <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't that be taught on the campuses that are in such turmoil? <laughs> I don't know how you begin with these people. Oh. They don't even think logical. Yeah, but they're going to start thinking because there's a there's a bill coming up in the legislature to cut off federal funding for anybody that's been involved in this. Um, That'll get their attention. Yeah, right. But you know. There shouldn't be federal funding. The government needs no, to No, there shouldn't bottom. be, but there is. Yeah, I know there but is. There is. But, and but that's, it, it, you know. it drives me nuts. And you still have coaching during college. Yeah. And, yeah. And what he says, that's why. That's why. That's why. The government is, is anytime the government gets involved in something, <laughs> it gets expensive. And there's, the no question. Question. So there's no question. Where, where he says, we don't be conformed to this world. That's a very difficult thing. There are some things that you have to conform to. There's nothing to do with the spiritual. But you're, it, 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 don't be conformed. To renew your minds. Look at something at, through the object of, of a Christian, not yeah. after the world. Yeah. Um, we used to talk about um, when, when you're dealing with um, uh, uh, Christian worldview, that you filter everything through what the, the grid of Scripture, you know, the Word of God. Well, that's um, one of the warnings too in Scripture is don't go in business. You're a Christian and yeah. a non-Christian. That other person may be very outstanding, but sooner or later your, your views are going to collapse. Yeah. So you don't be conformed. To it. It's, it's, yeah. Um. Anything else? I have a couple things. Okay. <laughs> I have a couple things. Um. First of all, um, the idea of um. The uh, uh, let me get back here and look at this example. Um, the the uh, New American Standard, which is what I tend to use, uh, talks about uh, be a living sacrifice acceptable God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Which obviously, if it's a, if that's the way the New American Standard translated, it's it's probably pretty accurate because it. It is a very good uh, translation, but I also think the word "reasonable" is should be used there. It's our reasonable service to be a living and holy sacrifice. It's reasonable to do. It's not. It's not something extraordinary that we should do when we're in Christ. It should be the reasonable thing to do, um, and and because it's reasonable, it is acceptable. But that's what our spiritual service of worship is. Something that's reasonable. It's not something that we should have to have to think about. Um, because as he said, we're to worship God in all things, in all things. So it's a reasonable thing to do. That was one thing. When we're talking about proving what the will of God is, how do we do that? You yeah, have to first of all learn through scripture. Okay. Whatever you're going to do. But then as I mean, uh well, just take marriage, for instance. You know you're not supposed to marry an unbeliever. Okay, that that that's clear cut. But then you have to are you are you compatible in finances and having children and all that all that needs to be worked through, but you don't Scripture lays the groundwork, and then you have to work through it. So, ask God to so direct. So, should people go through counseling before they get married to determine whether they're compatible in all areas? It, because it, isn't that a growing thing? It, it, yes, it depends on the counseling an awful lot. But I, I, it also, I, I don't know. I'm for counseling and, and against counseling. Uh, if, if I, 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 I'll tell you what, I think Marilyn and I had the best counseling because our pastor simply went through the marriage vows. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. 
And I think that's the best counseling you can get is going through the marriage files. And that's what that's what he did. And and uh, we're kind of sad in these couple of days because our pastor is in his last days. Um, if he if he has survived as he has. Getting to the marriage files where uh, Gabriel, what was his name, Gabriel? Something, Pastor. You know, a marriage is also a funeral. So. You were yeah. to die to yourself. I never heard this before. Yeah. And, you, and you, can you two or one? I think further in here, it talks about doing everything in the, the Philippians passage. Uh, let's run back to this. Bob and I never had counsel. We never had a witness. You we should. did nothing. You should. <laughs> we just went and got married. Yeah. So if there's, when we get down here, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Mm -hmm. So if you apply that to marriage, what should you be doing? Looking out for the interest of your spouse, not being selfish, you know. And when it comes down to conflict, what is conflict? It's one person being selfish against another. It's a it's a nation being as selfish against another one. That's what that's what creates conflict. But there's also how am I going to say this gently? There is also a point where one one side is right and one side is wrong. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not quite right, but I'm never wrong. Battery, battery Sergeant Woodrow is. You're right. You're right. You're, 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 I think some you want to have two arguments. Somebody's right or wrong. You got to come together and reason it out. Right. Yeah, right. But I mean, sometimes there's not there's not a way to compromise. It's you either do it or you don't do it. Like flowers or something. No, well, no, no that, that's always stuff. But uh, I, mean, well, I mean, to you, it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see how this. Let's, let's just see how this works out. <laughs> no, no, but okay, okay, uh, okay. I want to buy a Ferrari. Okay, okay. I'm set on bright red with whatever embellishments. He said, "Lynn, we can't afford that. Let's let's go for a." What's what's lower? Ford Mustang? Yes. Okay. You're buying a car, aren't you? I don't know. But anyway, somebody has to make a decision. We need four wheels to get to some place. Yeah. Well, then, you know. The, then what, I have to submit to him. It's it. The, 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 the guy made you block it, but that woman still should submit to it. But, yeah. but, the, but see, the conflict, the resolution of that comes through. Well, here's what Ferrari costs. Yeah. A Ferrari cost. Here's what we can afford. You know, Maryland's Maryland always says. Uh, my dad always said to make a list when you're making a decision of pros and cons. That's good. That's and good. if if in a marriage you understand that and you make that list on the, you know, you know, you, you go through it. You might not write it down necessarily. Mm -hmm. Because you're not a list maker. My wife is a list maker. Oh, I, I have to, there's power in striking off the <laughs> Well, uh, I, yeah, he's a German. But, but that, that's kind of a silly one, but, so, but there are. But, but no, you're there, right. There you're are, right. You're right. And I, I think that even as Christians, we need to ask ourselves should we be buying a Ferrari or should we be buying an Impala? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, because of the money, you know, that's involved in it. Um, of course, then there's um, there's always something that you see on Facebook that about uh, somebody saying to somebody, "Oh, you bought that Corvette. Think of all the people you could be feeding with the money." Well, then you list all the people that have jobs because you buy a Corvette and you've you know. So you know, there's a you, 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 you got you got to realize though that it, 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 on one basis, if you can afford a, a Rolls Royce, that's your prerogative. Yeah. But you don't take that Rolls Royce and go, to, go into the slums and, and start preaching the gospel. And what's the first thing those people are going to do? They're going to think that it doesn't that's a balance. Mm -hmm. You got to be thinking. I had a uh, I had a student at Geneva when we were doing some. Uh, I was doing some training with him. We were talking, and uh, 
And we're, of course, we were working in the inner city. And this guy says, yeah, he says, I'm going to work in the inner city when I when I graduate, when I get out in the world. I'm going to work in the inner city. And uh, he and, and as, as we talked and stuff, he said he, he wanted a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. And the reason he wanted a Cadillac is so that he could go in and show them what you could obtain if you were a believer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. But it's the same way. There's a lot of things. That, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. Boy, that really gets people. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah. true. Yeah. But, and, and you got to eat. Uh, yeah, so, but, so anyway. Um, how we measure the what what the will of God is is it's right here. Is it good? Is accept is it acceptable and is it perfect? You know how do we know what the will of God is? Well, we know that when we pray, um, "Thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven." How is God's will done in heaven? It's not perfect. We're asking for that on earth when we pray that. Um, so when we're looking for the will of God, we're looking for something that is perfect. We're looking for something that is perfect. So how do we kind of measure that? Ask the question, is this pleasing to God? You know, so when you're making the decision about the Ferrari, you, you know, maybe he says, you need to ask this question, is this pleasing to God? And then... You have to work through that. So yeah, that's, there's yeah. a lot of work. He needs to be gentle with me, but there are times when he needs to be stern. Stern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I, I submit to him, but sometimes, I mean, if he wants, if he wants to talk We're the lot, closing our life. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but if he wants a a, a five course meal every every day of the week. I can't produce that. There are other things that come in to, like where peanut butter and jelly sandwich thrown at him is fine. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, you've got to work this. Well, this is, let's say peanut butter and jelly would be the bread is a chorus, the peanut butter is a chorus. Yeah, it depends on how you And there's two, two pieces of bread. Yeah, but I, I remember growing up, it was, and, and this man would not allow his wife to pick a tomato off the tomato plant. And he would come home from work and he would count every tomato on that plant to make sure she didn't. Now, I mean, that... Right. I'm hmm? sorry. Yeah, but it's that's that, it's, that... I mean, so I've, I've grown up with a lot of kind of silly stuff. So it's... I, I didn't know my grandparents on my mother's side. And, uh, but my mother shared some things about them. <laughs> and she said her dad expected dinner to be on the table when he walked in the door from work you know now that means he would have he needed to get home from work at the same time every day i don't know that he did that but but uh it had to be on the table and that's that's well, what but, you see when i got expectation back then that wasn't it? probably my dad when, when 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 i was a little boy you come to the table to eat that's what you came to the table to. you didn't laugh you didn't do anything. And when he was sitting there, he threw that fork down. You know, you better shut up. And I was strict, but he changed after that. But but yeah, oh, I had a I had after you after you had kids for a while, right? <laughs> you no, know, he, he was very strict. Kids, kids they called are... the old Johnny Bull. Remember that's where the John Bull is. <laughs> yeah, but it, it it's interesting. But you have to work it out. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of like a cage match. A living sacrifice, it's a set every day. You yeah. must cook some, try to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what makes commentators frustrated about Romans 12 to 15? What did he say frustrated? I think it's all gold up. Yeah, yeah, it was just like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they don't have the understanding of the doctrine. Yeah, the commentators don't, uh, they don't know what chiasms are. What Paul? Oh, well, when, who invented a chiasm? I wonder what Paul would think about this teaching of chiasm. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it Paul wrote common, it that way. It was a common thing. Didn't he yeah. say that? Yeah, it was a common thing. It was the way Paul wrote it. Yeah. You know, if you remember Deuteronomy, remember the chiasm we had for Deuteronomy. And it worked. Mm -hmm. It worked. I mean, there was no question about it. And it's what he shows here. What he showed here on this one, and then the one we had on there before, so they work. And I think it's helpful. I think I, the more I see it, 
the more he's shared it with us, I think it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, if, now I, I don't have a mind that he does that he can go in and figure out what the chiasm is. I don't think I can figure that out. But uh, what does God, Dr. Godfrey believe about the structure of Paul's thought in this section? Well, that was exactly the chiasm. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, but, but he said Paul had stuff that he had to say and he did it in a way that showed that there was order about it. It wasn't just throwing a lot of thoughts together. Um, yeah, yeah. What is the primary thing that Paul is calling us to in Romans 12 to 15? What's the what's he calling? Love. Take love and live. Yeah. Yeah. Love and service. Yeah. Yeah. What is significant about Paul's use of the word bodies in Romans 12, 1? Well, how it all works together. And he, he referred back in another book about the eye doesn't do what the ear does. But we're all different. He, he said about the Indian and the Chinese that came into his church and their brothers. The boy, he sure stuck on being Dutch reformed. <laughs> <laughs> he won't give it. Which brings up a question, yeah. um, and I think... I think you are the only one that has the answer to this. Maybe. The Frisian. It's yeah, a part, it's a part of different part of um, Holland. The, oh, it, I mean, it's uh, like the, between Belgium and Holland. Okay. Okay. So, oh, okay. So. I know what a Frisian cow is. You've heard of that? That's a kind of cow that came from Frisia. Okay. Is it a country? Not separately, no. Just a, it's an area like you would yeah. say. I think. Okay. I, he, he said about being naive. I'm, I don't get jokes, and I was afraid to ask that. I'm glad you yeah. know. I didn't know what the outcome. Well, that makes sense because he <laughs> talked about them for, mm -hmm. uh, the people being from the Netherlands. If you, if you think about it, the country is called the Netherlands, but there are Dutch, uh, Dutch people and they don't necessarily in different parts of Holland. Are there like are there Holland, that speak but, French? Well, in, in the, Belgium they speak uh, Dutch and French. Yeah. In the northern part, they, yeah. they speak you know both yeah. of them. Well, are Holland and Netherlands the same? Yeah, you? see that's what I was gonna say. The Netherlands is the country and Holland is that people call it Holland, but really Holland is part of that country. Okay. You know, an area more of the country. So, North Carolina is part of the United States. Yeah, so like you have different areas, yeah. and uh, but they're maybe not. Well, Holland is probably pretty formal, but maybe the Frisian is not as formal. <laughs> no, you know. Maybe it's no, not no, as no. formal. Not, well, no. no, it is a formal area. <laughs> I mean, the, the word free doesn't really have any. Meaning in Frisian, it's just the name of the area. It's not the name, the way the people oh. behave. <laughs> oh, <laughs> can you have to look down on them? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> They're wonderful people. Okay, so and, and in the sense, the use of the word bodies just means that we all have different gifts that work together. You know, and and. One of the things a lot of times we discount is um, the person that sweeps floors should see that as being gifted rather than something that's at the bottom of the pack because they should be thinking, I'm doing this so that God is glorified. God has called me to this. This is what God has called me to. And I think we need to remember that. We're called... And, and, you know, I've, I've done a lot of different things. And I believe that I, I was called to everything that I did. Because a lot of the things that I did, it was just amazing how I got there. You know, I could see God working out how I got to be where I was. And um, they talk about networking. Well, networking is coming, you know, getting somebody... And how does that happen? Well, God brings you together with people. Um, so, uh, how are we to present our bodies as living sacrifices? Okay, how are we supposed to do this? 
That would be conforming to the law. That would be conforming to the law. Uh, and, and now, okay, I'm going to get into a sticky. Of course. Uh, no, I mean, are we, should our bodies be clean? I mean, there are circumstances. If you're in a foxhole, you can't have a clean body. I understand that. But I mean, should should you take time to, to clean your body uh, when you, you go out? Should you just roll out of bed and go to Walmart? You, you know, I mean, what does it what does it mean? How far do you go? Okay, I take a shower every morning, except when I'm doing yard work, and I take it after yard work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, well, you should stand. You, you, somehow, some way, you can lay, lay down this body of people. A Christian should stand out and wait. This guy or this man or woman over they they don't cuss or they don't do this or something. Yeah. There's something different in them. And they will come up and ask you, what why are you so different? So I mean, you, you can't be conformed to the whole thing. You gotta stand out, not proudly or anything, but you, you do. Yeah, it, it it's it's uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't know. I think you present your body in differently in different circumstances. Okay, here's, here's what my note on it says. Christian's mindset is to be determined and reshaped by the knowledge of the gospel, by the power of the spirit, and by the concerns of the age to come, rather than by the passing fashion of this age. Only by such sanctifying renewal is the Christian made su su sufficiently sensitive to discern the behavior that God's revealed will requires in each situation. So we go back. What is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect? What is the great motive in our relations with other Christians? What is important an important implication of this great motive? Serving Christ, but you also have to tell them the truth. Yeah. But you get back to the Philippians passage, and you do nothing out of selfish conceit, yeah. but in the best interest of others. Okay. What reason does Paul appeal to for our living a renewed life? Uh, well, uh, the service of God and the way the body how the individual body works together, we are to work together as, as a, a body of different parts, but we, we still yeah, work together. Yeah, but why do we oh, live? Um, yeah. He talks about God's grace. That we were His mercies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he set up all the stuff where you talked about mercies and different things. Now he's saying that's how we live a renewed life is by the mercies of God. And it's like the thing we read today. We talk about who we are in relationship to God. Our sanctification is to becoming more and more like God, like Christ. And so, so uh, that's a renewed life is not a completed life. Okay, because we're in process. We're reborn as babies. Oh, I like yes. this, this quote. Um, we can't think too highly of ourselves. We understand that our need. If we understand our need for mercy. Right. Amen. Yeah. Right. What great problem does Paul identify in Romans 12 and how we relate to other Christians? Um, Pride? Right. <laughs> uh, he said we think more highly, highly of ourselves than we yeah. should. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Is this something we struggle with? We don't have to answer this. <laughs> Yes, you, you, you. No, we all, we all be honest. Sure. We all struggle with stuff. Yeah. We, we don't, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and sometimes we have to realize we are presented in, to minister a ministry. Certainly, I think about Pete, you know, yeah, when Pete first started coming here, yeah. he was a real pain. Yeah, <laughs> he was a real pain, but look at him now, he's changed. He's changed. And it's because why? I love him. We accepted him. We, we accepted him. As tough as it was to do for a while, it was difficult. 
Um, but, you know, he responded to what he was told and, and uh, you know, he's doing much better. He's very faithful. Yeah, yeah. And how many people would walk from down there up to here to go to church? All right. Uh, this is uh, what we've just been talking about. Um, all right. What repeated idea flew Dr. Godfrey into the notion that Romans 12 to 15 is a chiasm? Love, no, no, wait, wait. Judgment. Judgment? No. Judgment. Yeah. Okay. What is Paul's central call in Romans 12 to 15? Yes. yes. The body is the seat of sin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, he says the body is a sign of sin. Yeah. Yeah. What does the Greek term commonly used for worship mean in Romans 12, 1 and 2? I think it's kneeling down. No, I think he's kneeling down. I'm sure that. I think you're all going to be surprised. Service. 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 That's not. <laughs> Service. Uh, he did say something about him and down. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but um, he, he goes through and he, he talks about the mercies of God to present your, your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. I thought you said he used the same word as they would use in reference to um, in being thankful and worshiping. So, well, we're in front of the temple, we're doing service. <laughs> they did so. I, mean, I understand. Yeah, it's um, uh, the New American Standard says spiritual service of worship. Spiritual service of worship. The idea that worship is in all of life often makes people think that the Lord's Day worship isn't required. But there is an attention between these two things. Is that true or false? <laughs> yeah, no, we should. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I get mixed up in a word. What adjective is connected with love in Romans 12? Genuine. Uh, genuine. 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 All right. That brings us to the end here. And uh, next week, we're going to look at the life of love. And we need to start thinking about what our next course is going to be because uh, there are. Uh, there's four lessons left. Yeah. So we need to think about, uh, do you want to do something that, you know, we've been in the Bible for well over a year on all our courses, um, maybe longer than that, because I forget what we were doing prior to uh, to the uh, dust of glory. But do you, want to, do, you want to, do you want me to find another study in, in uh, scripture? Do you want to look at something that's more theological? Uh, something you want to do something uh, in history. Just think about those things because there's still plenty of stuff yeah. to, to do. I'm so. not going to do anything. I like it all. Yeah. I'm going to do it. <laughs> all right. Well, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And thank you that uh, we get such great instruction from the scriptures. Um, forgive us for just not implementing it well into our lives. Um, we, we seek to serve you, we seek to serve others, and we seek to do it in a way that is good, acceptable, and perfect in your sight. Um, we just often so, so often fall so short of that. So Lord, uh, please uh, forgive us for that and help us now as we come to worship you in spirit and truth to put aside those things that keep us from being able to worship you that way. And we pray for Steve as he brings us the message and pray for uh, uh, um, Mark as he is the uh, open leader. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless, uh, bless them this day. Thank you for all things, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready to go to the I may see you after the service. I mean, much. Thank you. Thank you.